<laughs> Welcome to Parent Talk Podcasts, where experienced parents and expert guests give tips and tricks on making parenting a breeze. Well, at least a little easier. Now here is your host, Genevieve Kyle, and co-host, Heather Fox. Welcome to Season 4 of Parent Talk, where we strive to parent authentically and continue to grow alongside our children. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Genevieve Kyle, mom of two. We are broadcasting out of the Greater Vancouver area and are proud to provide the most up-to-date expert information for today's parent. Our goal is to inspire you to become a more confident, peaceful, connected, and authentic parent. I'm, of course, with my co-host, Heather Fox. Hi, Heather. Hi, everyone. Yes, Heather Fox here, co-host of Parent Talk and also a mom of two. We all know that parenting is a journey and one that shouldn't be taken alone. Being the best parent we can be means listening, learning, and sometimes asking for help. Our community will bring you strength and support along the way from pregnancy to puberty and beyond. Yes. Today we're talking about tantrums, the opportunity to connect with our child. We are very lucky to have with us Dr. Deborah McManara. She is a clinical counselor and developmentalist on faculty at Newfeld Institute and director of Kids Best Bet, a counseling center for families, author of Rest, Play, Grow, Making Sense of Preschoolers, or anybody that acts like one. <laughs> And her new book, The Sorry Plane, that she just launched. The Sorry Plane is a children's picture book illustrated by Zoe C. And is about respecting the feelings of children and supporting their emotional development. Hi, Deborah, and welcome back to Parent Talk Podcast. And thanks for having me, ladies. We love having you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so our first question for you today is, uh, what is happening in our little one's brain when they end up having a tantrum? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we wish to. <laughs> oh, what a million dollar question, eh? I mean, really, it just doesn't make sense sometimes. It's just the smallest thing just can set them off. Like, you know, the wrong shaped spoon or, you know, the wrong colored socks. And you're like, what is going on? I think that's the whole point is that they don't oftentimes make sense. And uh, then we can be very frustrated with their reactions as a, as a result. But when a child is having a tantrum, I think the, the one thing we could probably be sure of is that that child is frustrated. And frustration is a raw, primal emotion. It's hardwired into the brain. You can never get rid of it. So the question is, is what's the purpose of frustration? If frustration is the root behind, the root emotion that... Uh, you know, gives rise to tantrums, uh, to yelling, to any kinds of hostili hostility that you might see in a child, words, verbal, they could be verbal as physical. Uh, frustration is at the root of this and frustration is the emotion of change. You want something to change or you want it to stop. And so a child has encountered something that is futile. They want it to stop or they want it to change. It's not going their way. They're frustrated. They could be frustrated for physical reasons. They could be frustrated and thwarted in their environment. They're not getting, you know, yogurt instead of mango. Who knows what's going on, but you can be sure that that temper tantrum has some element of frustration. They want something to change. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to avoid tensions? <laughs> <laughs> or are they normal or healthy part of growing up? Well, if we understand that frustration is hardwired, then you can see the problem here is, is that we all get frustrated. The problem for our young kids is that they don't have the centers of the brain that actually put the brakes on them. Uh, that doesn't come till about five to seven when your prefrontal cortex kicks in and has connections with the emotional centers of the brain so that when it feels the signal to attack, it also feels the other emotion saying stop, which is about caring. One side of you, uh, you know, feels like lashing out in frustration. The other side of you says stop. And that's the prefrontal cortex integration that usually happens between the ages of five and seven that puts on the brakes of aggression that usually comes from Uh, frustration so frustration uh, can we stop it no um, <laughs> I wish we could uh, we can make it a whole lot worse for our preschoolers we can end up with huge eruptions 
because uh, we often get frustrated and put more frustration on them. It's like, you know, okay, well, they, they're, you know, they're yelling or frustrated somewhere. We say, okay, well, you can't have that and you can't do this. And here's a consequence and here's this. Well, that increases frustration. And so you end up in huge attacking behavior. Uh, we don't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that when I've done it, but we do it because we're usually frustrated. So no, we're not going to get rid of frustration, but we are meant to become more mature. <laughs> when we feel frustration, we will, we are also meant to feel caring so that that puts a break on lashing out without thinking, without pausing, without considering the impact of your behavior or your words on another person. There's two times in life where you'll be most untempered with your frustration, meaning that they will likely, uh, you know, not be mixed with caring and you'll get really more impulsive levels of frustration. And that's in the preschooler. And you want to guess the other time when you see this? Teenagers? <laughs> mm -hmm. Winner, winner. <laughs> Uh, and I would also say even as becoming a parent, when you are now being tested to have patience when your child is so full of frustration. So, and that's related to brain development. Both the preschooler and the adolescent are going through phenomenal brain development and the signals and the emotions get really quite intense. And so the brain needs some time to wire up. So what is the best way that we as caregivers can handle these tantrums? Oh, well, <laughs> I breathe uh, first. I mean, when a child is frustrated, oh, it depends what headspace you're in sometimes. It can just hit you upside the head and you just like, you just have so little patience yourself. And then sometimes on a good day, you've got lots of rest and patience. We just don't know when they're going to hit us. So I think the first idea would be try not to make it worse for you or for the child. Try not to do any harm in the moment and realize that your child, especially young children, have lots of things that are frustrating, things that they want to do they can't do. You know, they want to be first. They want to change your mind. They want, you know, they want to defy gravity. Uh, you know, they, <laughs> they're not logical. There's so many things that, uh, that can frustrate them that don't go their way. Anytime you say no, you know, clothing, clothing, ugh. They're just like, what's the point of clothing? You know, we came out into this world naked. Why can't we just stay this way? Like, there's so many things for them that are just frustrating, you know? And so try not to make it worse. And I think to be patient and to realize that frustration, like all emotion, needs to be expressed. The challenge with frustration is, of course, it can be very egregious. It can They can hurt a sibling. They can throw stuff. They can you know, say things. I'd rather a child say things out of frustration than throw things. But a child under the age of three is usually quite physical. By the time three and a half, four onwards to become much more verbal, which is good. I hate you, poo poo face mummy. You're not my favorite person. You're not coming to my birthday party. And you're like, okay, I can handle this. A train to the head. Mm, you know, that's a little bit more challenging. So remember, there is development that will happen here. Try not to add to the frustration. Remember, frustration has to be expressed. Encourage words is the answer to frustration. You're really frustrated. You don't want to put away your toys. You don't want to get dressed. Um, you don't want to go to bed. I, I see that. Um, and if they need to have tears, just let them have their tears around frustration. You know, put a little sadness in your voice. It's hard when you don't get what you want. I know, uh, you know, or, you know, mommy has to go to work. I know. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you later. It's okay. I'll be thinking of you too. Um, and it's okay for to melt that frustration. If they can't change something, that frustration has to change them. And that's a pathway of tears. So sometimes someone's going to have to help them on that pathway of tears. Sometimes the frustration is going to come out and some attacking behavior if you can move it in ways that are not going to obviously injure the child or other children um, or put your body in harm's way, <laughs> although how much harm a three-year-old can do, um, you know, you can be thoughtful about that where you put your body and just try to ride through the storm, ride through what needs to come through and uh, turn it into sadness and be patient. It uh, does take a lot of emotional energy from us. But I think where we get into trouble is when we put a lot of our emotion onto our preschooler. So uh, remember, nature's got an answer here. Five to seven, the child would be much more tempered. But 
Yeah. Um, you've got to, you've got to ride the storm a little bit. (laughs) But what do we do if actually it is dangerous to keep the two child in the same room or yourself? Mm -hmm. I actually have a friend of mine who was just talking about Mm -hmm. this. Well, I mean, you just take the lead however you need. Mm -hmm. Take the lead, like move one child. I would pick up my youngest child uh, when my eldest was having a a temper tantrum because she would go right for her. And so she wasn't safe. So that was always my first you know, protocol in my head was pick up the youngest and protect her, uh, take away anything that could be used to, to hurt somebody because she was a thrower. So I knew the objects would get thrown. So I would take anything that like the glasses off her face or whatever it was, because she'd throw those and break those and hurt herself or someone else when she was really stirred up. And, uh, I would just say, I'll take, I'll hold on to these for you. I know you're upset. And, um, uh, you know, you just don't make it worse, you know, protect what you can, move it along, try not to control an out of control child. I think that's what we do a lot of the times we try to, you know, you can't do that. You got to stop saying that you got to stop hitting. They know all this, but you're trying to control an out of control child. It's much better to take control of the circumstances you can move the child you can move the objects you can Uh, as soon as you let the frustration dissipate itself out and be expressed for any length of time tears and uh, you know yelling and stomps and stuff uh, you know you can have that going on for 10 minutes 15 minutes half an hour if you're not aggravating it more um, a child should hopefully get to their tears sooner than later um, about what they can't have the other thing I I want to say is that sometimes we don't know why our children are frustrated. We don't have a clue. And sometimes it's complete, their reactions are completely disproportionate to whatever just happened. Someone said no to a train or there's, they can't find the train they want. And, you know, it's four o'clock at night. You've picked them up from daycare. They can't find the train they want or the smallest thing doesn't go their way. And they unleash unleash a fury of frustration you're like what is going on what we don't realize is that that frustration can be displaced from the day that they've just had like being away from their attachments is one of the most frustrating things for a young child they're not going to let that go in a in a daycare oftentimes they're far too alarmed or uh, it isn't the place where that frustration would come out it might come out a little bit but nothing like when their caretaker returns and so you return home you pick up the child and then the smallest thing doesn't work and boom out comes all of the frustration as if vomiting all over the place uh, because again you're in a context where frustration is meant to be taken care of you're with your caretaker so emotion doesn't always come out where it's stirred up and we don't know the sources of frustration but it needs to be expressed it may need to soften into tears we will be tested to be patient but the focus shouldn't be on the behavior but on the emotion of frustration Mm -hmm. so what do we do to avoid being triggered by our little one's tantrums (laughs) (laughs) you're asking me as if I have an answer like for myself (laughs) I have not yet been found that. I'm always, I I can't, there's some moments where I can say I haven't been frustrated when they're frustrated, but I got teenagers now too, right? So, I mean, their frustration is a whole other level sometimes. I got to say when I'm tired. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I'm definitely more triggered. Well, we know we don't have any glucose in the prefrontal cortex, but (laughs) tempers are big feelings. Yeah. So that's exactly it. Um, Or you're sick, or if you've had any alcohol, that's not good. That that anesthetizes the prefrontal cortex. So, and, and also if you're multitasking and you've got other responsibilities, I mean, we've got, you know, those things are just frustrating all on their own. So how do we not be triggered? I think it's, I think if you think that you're not going to get triggered by your children, you're going to set yourself up over and over again to be sorely disappointed and very frustrated with yourself. And you're going to think that you're a very bad parent because you got upset because your child was having some strong emotion. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to like, just be so, you know, moments where you want to throw in the towel like you know not saying that's happened to anybody here (laughs) we might be three for three all i'm saying is that's okay in the sense that our emotions get big too 
what we should strive for is not to let our big feelings come tumbling out onto our children who have to bear the responsibility for them. It's not their job to fix our emotions. It's our job to find more caring. It's our job to look at our child and say, it's not their job to carry this. Oh my gosh, how am I going to carry this frustration they have? What do I do in this moment to take care of my child's big emotions? What do I need to do for that child? And the more you focus on your child, the more you'll dig deeper because you care about your child to dig deeper. Uh, But don't think you'll ever stop being triggered. We will. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, everyone. This is the answer. (laughs) The answer is to to be patient with yourself and have some grace and mercy Mm -hmm. and, and just not to let them know what's going on in your head. Mm. Just keep showing up and taking care of them. Uh, and uh, and I'll da- I I would dare say that they'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> they know when we multitask. Mm-hmm. They know when we're not fully present. They just mm-hmm. know. Alex knows. He's mm-hmm. so like watching me. And I, in those moments, he actually now that's the moment, and he wants three hundred percent of my attention. You know, yeah. because he knows I'm trying to accomplish two things. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. So I have to stop. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's okay yeah. for us to say no. You know, I can't give you my full attention now. I'd like to. I'll get back to you, uh, you know, later and play this game with you. I'd love to. It's just going to have to require five minutes or ten minutes. Or, you know, if you've got a child, you've got, well, you've got a three-year-old. But mm-hmm. I'm thinking more like a four or five-year-old. They have a little bit more capacity to wait. Sometimes three-year-olds don't wait so well. Um, but, you know, sometimes our children can hear a, a no from us and be invited to have their tears and their frustration about it. And, you know, I have to cook dinner. You're welcome to come alongside me. You're welcome to read some books. Well, I don't want that. I know. I can see that and, and that's okay. You can be upset and be upset beside me and I'll need to get on with stuff here and I'll take care of you too. Uh, and sometimes we have to try to give generously. I think parents work really hard today to make their kids happy. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think we don't always have to do that. Not that we have to torment them, but it's okay for them to feel sad that we can't always do or be what they want. Um, that's just part of life as long as we give them you know, as, as long as we build deep relationships with them, um, they can handle disappointment, sadness, and things not always going their way. Mm-hmm. Deborah, should we reveal our agenda to our little ones? So when you say agenda, what I hear in that is like mm-hmm. your ideas about what you want them to do or... Yeah, like you have to get thinking. dressed because we're going to see grandma, mm-hmm. we're going to gymnastics mm-hmm. or, you know. I think that orienting a child to uh, the day... You know, this is what's happening and this is where we're going and all the rest of it and giving them the shape of the day is a helpful thing generally. I would say that the more they feel like you are bossing them around or telling them what they have to do, especially with a young child, three, four years of age, they're kind of allergic to um, you, you know, they're allergic to being told what to do so directly. They like hearing and being oriented to the structure and routine and stuff, but there's a way that we can say things like, you're going to need to get your shoes on now because we're in a hurry and we got to go. As soon as they know you're in a hurry, as soon as you're, you're ad- yeah, <laughs> as soon as your agenda is stronger than theirs, this is chapter uh, nine in, in Rest, Play, Grow, it's Encounter Will, Resistance and Opposition. And three and four year olds, actually even as young as two and a half, as soon as you start revealing your agenda, this is what I need you to do. Here's a sticker. Uh, this will be the reward. Uh, way to go. Good boy. Good girl. Then you're like, they know exactly what you want. And um, they can feel very coerced. And when a three, four-year-old feels coerced, they're going to back up. Because that's the age when having a sense of agency, having your own mind, being your own person really is one of the strongest times. Besides, again, it comes back in, in um, adolescence. So they don't when they feel your agenda is bigger than their desire, they're going to back up and dig in. The more they have to go to school, the more they don't want to. The more they have to eat their broccoli, the more they don't want to. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me, you know, when I was little, it never occurred to me that I had to eat broccoli. And then I remember watching one children's show where they were praising a child for eating broccoli. And I'm like, what's up with the broccoli? 
Why are so many people happy? Why are those adults so happy with those peop- that child eating broccoli? What's the matter with broccoli? It never <laughs> occurred to me that broccoli, there was something wrong with it. But the adults doth protest too much that it was a wonderful thing. I'm like, there's something up here that I've missed. And we don't realize from a child's perspective how we give our agenda away so easily. There's a difference between telling them, you know, the shape of the day, what's coming up versus they can see it in your eyes. Okay, we're going to get dressed now in the back of your head. Like, please don't fight me on getting dressed. And like, you're dead. You're dead in the water with a three-year-old. <laughs> they see you coming. They're locking Hedson down. Hudson loves getting dressed, right, Heather? <laughs> it's his favorite activity of the day. <laughs> Let's just say we show up in pajamas a lot of different places. Yeah, pajamas are fantastic. We're now spending hundreds of dollars to get pajamas to wear everywhere. Adults are, we love our uh, our casual wear. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so what are the benefits of connecting with our child during and after a tantrum? You know, this is such an interesting question. Oftentimes I think people... Uh, see when a child is having frustration and temper tantrums this is not a time when you want to get close to your child uh this doesn't draw out your uh oh let's come have a hug and a cuddle you know and and when they're hitting uh it probably isn't the best time to go in for a hug and a cuddle but what does it say to a child when you can be patient with them what does it say to a child when you can acknowledge their frustration and you can invite the expression and you're not going to go away and you can be patient you can have limits of course Uh, no we can't do that I can't let you throw that I can see you're frustrated you know I remember now as you ask that question I remember sometimes with my daughter my uh one of my very sensitive kids and she would have sometimes the frustration would be so big It'd be like the perfect storm. She'd be tired. She'd be hungry. She might have had too much separation that day that was too much for her, so stirred up. And and she would just come undone. You know, those days, she just come undone completely. We, I still have them as an adult. And I remember, so for whatever reason, I, I can remember one time I was so patient through it and uh, so gentle and, you said, you know, the limits were there, but I was just patient and I just wrote it out. And I can remember after she had her deep cry and her sobs, and you can tell when your child's doing it because they're like, (gasps) and it goes down and you can hear it go down. I remember she looked at me and she said, Mommy, thank you so much. Wow. I love you. And it was this deep sense of uh, in her, I could hear the gratitude for the fact that she was so distraught and I had been so caring and uh, I wish, you know, the tantrums were all like that. They certainly weren't. But I can tell you that I do know uh, for a child and certainly my own experience as a parent that when you can hold on during such adverse conditions sometimes for both of you or su- not adverse but such difficult emotions, you know, coming to the surface, if you can hold on to the relationship and you can hold on to their heart and you don't wound them, um, then I think it strengthens the relationship. There's more trust in you because at the time when they were most vulnerable, when they were most egregious, you held on. And I think uh, if someone does that for us in our personal relationships, there's more trust, there's more faith, there's more confidence in the provider. And that's what children uh, need. And that's how they feel close is that this is a good provider. I can come undone and my provider holds on to me. It's a pretty tall order for us. And we surely won't get it right all the time. But I can tell you, it's pretty powerful when you do. Mm -hmm. I have Deborah's book here, Rest, Play, Grow. And I recommend anybody to go to Chapter (laughs) 7, Tears and Tantrum, Understanding Frustration and Aggression. Uh, I've read the entire book. And what I love about your book, Deborah, it's uh, you can pick one chapter or one chapter where you're at and you can read about it and put it aside and you can pick up the book and read about wherever you're at. So, and I love this because in this day and age, I don't have a lot of time to read an entire book in a week. Well, to read a book in a week, it's a miracle anyways, (laughs) (laughs) but this is a fantastic book. And, um, 
I think we're going to have to do a giveaway with the book too. I think so. <laughs> I know. So Heather, can you talk to us about the giveaway? Yeah. So anyone, of course, who is listening, all you got to do is go find us on social media, Facebook or Instagram. And um, of course, on the post for this podcast, if you like, share or comment, um, you are going to be entered to win your very own copy of Rest, Play, Grow. So we're so excited to be able to share that with you all. Awesome. Debra, we can find you on our panel of experts. Where else can we find you? On uh, the web. So McNamara.ca and social media channels like uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. All right, ladies. Well, thank you so much, Debra and Heather, for uh, being here and helping us be the best parents we can be. If you have a question or you would like to join us on our show as a guest or as an expert, please visit the contact us section on our website at parenttalk.ca. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and now also on YouTube at Parent Talk TV. Of course, you can always subscribe directly to this podcast on our website at parenttalk.ca. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and invite you to share it on social media. As we all know, parenting can be hard. So remember, it's important to laugh, keep learning, cherish your village and be true to yourself. Thank you for joining us and have a great week. The views and or opinions of the host and their guests are not necessarily those of Parent Talk and should not be considered as fact. The information offered is believed to be accurate but is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be used for diagnosing or treating any health issue or prescribing medication. If you have any questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your child, please seek assistance from a qualified healthcare practitioner. Thank you.